Welcome to the African Campfire Stories podcast. This podcast is dedicated to covering events from African history. You can visit us at our social media pages on Twitter, African Campfire Stories, on Facebook, African Campfire Stories, on Instagram, African Campfire Stories. Our website is www.africancampfirestories.com. On our website, you'll find podcast episodes, articles, and other African history content. We have 17 episodes at this point, and more are uploaded frequently. Should you pick up any errors that we might make, please use the platforms mentioned above to provide us with your comments and input. We use a lot of history sources in creating our podcast. We therefore would like to thank all history authors and researchers out there. Your work enables us to exist. Before we go into today's episode, please be aware that Cold War Pawns is a series. The first episode of this series is Cold War Pawns Episode 2. We are also running another series called Xenophobia and Hatred. It is also available on our website. Without much further ado, here is today's episode. This is Cold War Pawns Episode 14, Lumumba and Mobutu Part 2. We stated in Episode 13 that Mobutu and Lumumba represent the kind of people that ran the gamut of the top of African politics from the years of African independence in the late 1950s till the Cold War period came to an end in the early 1990s. Lumumba represents the idealistic mercurial and overzealous activist slash revolutionary. Mobutu represents the stern and fatherly big man of Africa, the kind of person that in the end came to be seen as the typical post-independence African leader. In episode 13, we provided a quick background on Lumumba. Today, it's Mobutu's turn. The man who would eventually be grandiosely called Mabutu Seseseko Kuku Mbendu Wazabanga, who was born with the much simpler name of Joseph Desire Mabutu in 1930. This makes him five years younger than Lumumba. Mabutu was born in Lesala, in what was then known as the Belgian Congo, and he was a member of the Ngbadi ethnic group. There is this crazy story to do with Mabutu's mother. This story occurred in the years or year before Mobutu was born. I don't know if this story is true or not, and if any of you guys out there know of any credible sources on this particular story, please let me know. The story goes that Mobutu's mother, Mary Madeleine Yemo, had fled from her local village and went to Lisala because the chief of her native village had been keeping her in a harem. The word harem has its origin in the Arabic language, and it could mean many things. In the West, it is taken to mean a group of women who exist to serve the sexual desires of a man of significant status. This story could have originated with Mobutu's political enemies later on in his political career, or this whole story could have been propaganda that originated from his later supporters who wanted to emphasize the kind of challenges Mobutu had to overcome to get to the top. In any case, back to our story. Mobutu did have it hard growing up. He lost his father when he was around eight. His mother was not well off, so she sent him away to stay with relatives. Both Lumumba and Mobutu had it hard when they were growing up. Both of their formal education does not appear to have been of the highest caliber. They both had some education at missionary schools. In colonial era DRC, education was handled by church folks from Belgium and other European countries. To make up for their unspectacular formal education, both engaged in a process of self-education as adults. They both had very keen minds and they both read extensively to further their knowledge and understanding of the world around them. If one looks closely, one can pick up some key differences in their choice of materials they used to educate themselves as young adults. Mobutu, the future big man of Africa, read the writings of Winston Churchill those of French leaders Charles de Gaulle and those of that quintessential author of practical, unsentimental political intrigue, the Italian philosopher Niccolo Machiavelli. This, together with the fact that Mobutu liked to read newspapers as a means to further his self-taught studies and the fact that he joined the military pretty early in his life, makes for a practical mind. <laughs> 
It's the kind of reading that teaches a person about statecraft and historical greatness. As we shall see now, Lumumba's reading was mainly on conceptual and philosophical tomes, head in the clouds kind of stuff. The army served Mobutu at a critical juncture in his life. It came at a point in his life when he needed mentors and guidance. Some of the most senior figures he met in the army became sort of his surrogate father figures and taught him respect for authority and discipline. Talking about discipline, here is yet another story that could have been made up later on about Mobutu. This one took place during Mobutu's missionary school years. Apparently Mobutu was so strict in manner, so uncompromising, that he would correct his priest teacher when the latter made mistakes in French. <laughs> the poor teacher was Dutch. So it seems that he had mastered French well enough and the young Mobutu could correct the teacher pedantically every time the teacher made a mistake, regardless of how minor the mistake was. The story continues. Mobutu is said to have joined the army because he fled from his Catholic missionary school and hooked up with some girl. Not much is said about this girl or the exact nature of this hookup. Somehow, his priest teacher managed to find Mobutu weeks later, and as punishment for his transgression, the priest made him choose between prison and joining the Belgian-controlled army of the DRC. Mobutu chose the army, which was called Force Publique at that time. Again, we are not saying that this story is true, and it's very possible that Mobutu's propagandists or his enemies made up this story later on. Regardless of how he ended up joining the army, the fact that he joined the army was a fateful decision, not just him, but for millions of Congolese people, as we will see in the next episode of Cold War Pawns. Without the army, we probably would have never heard of Mobutu. In general terms, as we will see later on in our Cold War Pawn series, in post-independence African countries, the army would provide a means for many future leaders to ascend to the heights of political power. So Mobutu was not unique. His case is part of a pattern we will unfortunately see a lot in this series. So, how did Lumumba educate himself? The rabid revolutionary-to-be was reading typical 20th century revolutionary favorites like the French Enlightenment authors Rousseau and Voltaire. He also read other authors like Victor Hugo and Molière, who are respected for their intellect. While Mobutu would find his way into politics through the Belgian-controlled army of the DRC, then through journalism, and then the army again, Lumumba took the path of a real revolutionary. He was involved in political activity. He joined political groups and political parties early on. Lumumba would later co-found the rabidly anti-colonial and nationalistic MNC political party which we've explained in some details in episode 12 and 13. Mobutu started writing as a journalist while he was still in the army. He was writing for a magazine that had been set up by the Belgians. He was in an army which was controlled by the Belgian state. The army of the DRC under Belgium, the so-called Force Publique, was led by thousands of Belgian officers. So the discipline that Mobutu learned was the kind of strict obedience that a soldier had to show unquestioningly to his officers, that is, his superiors in the force public chain of command. He later went to Belgium and he enrolled for further studies in journalism while there. Here, you have two different foundational theories. At least the foundational theories of these two men as young adults because their stories pertaining to their respective childhoods are pretty much the same. But as young adults, one person was involved in the rough and tumble of anti-colonial politics. He is participating in nationalistic-oriented political parties and he eventually co-founded a nationalistic anti-colonial political party. On the other hand, you have another young person whose development as a young adult was largely through an army that was controlled by Belgium. And the remainder of his development occurred through working for a Belgian magazine and going to study in the colonial mother country itself. Please forgive me if I'm appearing as if I'm presenting a seemingly simplified deterministic theory of how these two men developed and how they would end up later in their lives. History can be tricky in the sense that we know already how the events and the people we are studying will end up. So 
We should avoid the pitfalls of cherry-picking the things from history narratives that fit nicely within the point we want to make. Hindsight, as they say, is 2020. Maybe things such as Lumumba's and Mobutu's early reading habits did not have much to do with their later character traits. But nonetheless, after hearing the facts about both of their backgrounds, whom do you think the Belgians would prefer to work with after independence? Whom do you think the Americans are going to prefer? Remember, these questions count because right now in this era we are talking about, it matters whether the Americans like you. It seems like long ago in this series that we used to mention the world's Cold War in every paragraph. Well, our story is the Cold War era and it is about the Cold War. We have not been mentioning the Cold War so much of late because we've laid the full background of what the Cold War was about and what it entailed. We did so back in episode 2 to 9. For the past few episodes, we needed to lay the foundation for the understanding of the events that were occurring inside the DRC. If you came only after the Cold War, we apologize profusely. We promise you that you'll be as happy as heck pretty soon, as our story will now need to integrate the events of the DRC with the bigger Cold War events occurring at an international level. Remember, in episode 12, we mentioned that the Belgians hated and feared Lumumba. Well, the Belgians were American allies. The Belgians also hated and feared the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR. Remember the USSR? We haven't spoken about them in a while. By the way, if you've just joined our series right now, and this is specifically to the listeners who can't wrap their heads around the idea of a state that doesn't exist anymore, earlier on in this series, we did give the audience the permission to think of the USSR as Russia. So whenever we say USSR in this series, just think of Russia, if that is much better for you to process. Remember, the events mentioned in episode 2-4, to four, Russia became the USSR in 1917 when the communists took over and then became Russia again in 1991 when the Communist Party of the USSR lost power. We could get into a long and dragged out discussion of why the Belgians hated Lumumba, Episode 12 does help a bit in providing an understanding of this hatred, and the next episode will flesh it out even more. But what we didn't mention in episode 12 are Lumumba's perceived insults to the Belgian power structure. Let us look at just one example where the person insulted was the king of the Belgians. Please forgive my pronunciation. The king in question was King Bodouin. And the event of the insult was on the 30th of June in 1960, which is the day Belgium officially handed power to the DRC. This event was attended by the cream of Belgian politics, by Congolese representatives, and by a large assortment of international dignitaries representing many countries. There was also a large amount of journalists and reporters representing hundreds of international media houses. Indeed, this event was a big deal. The king of the Belgians took to the podium to make a patronizing speech about how great Belgium had been for the DRC and how marvelous King Leopold II of the Belgians had been to the DRC. If you remember from episode 11, King Leopold II was the original colonizer of the DRC. He colonized the DRC after the Berlin Congress of 1885. This congress was explained in episode 10. If you've been following this series so far, you will know that every decent person should feel offended by the assertion that Leopold II was good for the DRC. Lumumba wasn't going to take the sitting down. In fact, he had to sit down because as Prime Minister and not the President, he was not supposed to talk on this occasion. To everyone's surprise, he took to the floor and gave a retort to the King's speech that had every Belgian in the room extremely shaken. The king and his entourage were flaming with anger. The Congolese in the room welcomed Lumumba's unscheduled speech, and it received significant amount of applause from them, not caring at all that his speech was inflammatory to the Western international community. Lumumba then had his speech printed and distributed across the DRC. Joseph Kasavubu, whom we introduced in episode 12, was the president of the DRC, and he was scheduled to speak at the event. He was also angered by the king's patronizing speech. 
But his way of responding to the king's speech was to leave out the parts of his speech that were meant to give compliments and praise to the king. Of course, this Lumumba versus the king episode has a very funny ring to it. And it is by no means the only reason why Lumumba lost favor with the Western countries and the USA. We have mentioned before how mercurial Lumumba was. Many historians argue that Lumumba was not prepared for high office. But other historians state that Lumumba was the type of African politician that was not willing to stroke the egos of the West. Whatever the truth may be, Lumumba's behavior and speeches attracted the undying hatred and fear of the West. So, by the time Lumumba went on a begging world tour to seek assistance for the DRC, he wasn't well received in places like Britain, Canada and the USA. The UN did eventually help by airlifting some troops into the DRC, troops that were largely from African countries, by the way. However, Lumumba then demanded that the UN troops should kick the remaining Belgian troops out of the DRC. To Western eyes, Lumumba was going too far, and not just in this particular instance, but in almost everything he did. At this time, the DRC army was controlled by Belgian officers. This had been part of the deal that the DRC politicians had made with Belgium as part of the process of gaining independence. Lumumba suspected that the Belgians were purposefully mismanaging the post-independence army of the DRC. As rebellions began everywhere in the country and inside the army of the DRC, Lumumba entered into a severe state of agitation and paranoia. He was seeing Belgian underhandedness everywhere he looked. To be fair, some of Lumumba's suspicions were actually correct. But some were pure paranoia. Looking back, it's difficult to understand why Lumumba would be so careless with his words and actions during such a sensitive period in the history of the world and in particular the history of Africa. And I'm not just saying this because he was making the West angry. The problem Lumumba was facing was actually right there next to him in the person of Mabutu. The other thing that Lumumba seems to have ignored to his detriment was the cultivation of a relationship with the USSR. If you were going to piss off America during the Cold War, it did you some good if you balanced that out by getting the protection of the USSR at least. But Lumumba was too independent-minded. This is a good thing sometimes, but not that smart in times like those of the Cold War. Especially if you were a leader of a poor country that needed lots of help from the outside world. America could conspire with Mobutu, but Mobutu was not an innocent person whom the CIA manipulated against his will. This series is called The Cold War Pawns, but as you will see, as we cover more and more African countries in the series, some of these pawns were very willing pawns. Mobutu was one of those pawns. We have reached the end of today's episode. Next time, we will finish off the story of Lumumba versus Mobutu. Lumumba, being naive and idealistic, will appoint Mobutu to be his aide and then subsequently make Mobutu the most powerful man in the DRC army, thus setting the stage for his own removal and murder. Hopefully after that, we will do one more episode on the DRC leg of the Cold War Pawn series and then move on to the next African country. The plan right now is that the next country will be Angola. So stay tuned. See you next time.